Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. On this episode, we've got a special guest today. Joe Sinclair from Quality Ag Services joins us to talk about the herbicide outlook and shortages for the 2022 growing season. Ben and Joe attended the MS Technologies Field Day this past week. Hear what they learned. Joe predicts the potential future of the Dicamba label. Hi, this is Joe Mershman. Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have a special guest. We have Joe Sinclair from Quality Ag Service and of course Ben. And you know, I really think we need to talk with, to Joe first because uh, Joe being an expert in the uh, herbicide world, uh, been in business, what, over 20 some years doing which? Yeah. Why don't you tell us, I mean, everybody's talking about herbicides and how expensive they are and can you get them and particularly uh, glufosinate, glyphosate. Tell us, tell us what's going on. Well, we broke into this business 27 years ago, Joe, and we've never seen a year like this. The supply chain constraints, the lack of raw materials going into the products that, that we put onto the fields to protect the crop from pests like fungus, weeds, and insects. It's unprecedented to be this low on inventory at this time of year. So it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a struggle for uh, our industry to be able to take care of the North American farmer in 2022. Well, Joe, is, are the branded products any different than the generics? Or are we, are the, we both in the same boat? Or is, is, is there gonna be, you know, are, how bad is it gonna be? I mean, so, you know, we got farmers out there really getting concerned, you know, we're hearing 90 some dollar uh, glufosinate prices per gallon. And I mean, what's, what's really happening? Well, I will say this about, about the whole Midwest, especially corn and soybeans. A producer is gonna need to have a pretty good idea what it's gonna cost him to plant the crop prior to going to the field. Nitrogen has more than doubled. And if, if you take that into consideration, uh, phosphorus almost doubled, potash almost tripled from year ago levels. So you, you've got these huge price increases in fertilizer. Corn requires a lot more fertilizer than soybeans does. So the, the University of Illinois, this is not counting the price increases in crop protection chemicals, but the University of Illinois' economics department put out a study that a central Illinois farm would lose $24 per acre planting corn and on the same day, they would make $170 planting soybeans. And that's available at the Extension website for the University of Illinois. So I don't think a farmer is going to want to go to the field planning on losing money on his crop. So I, I think there's going to be a migration with intentions to plant soybeans. And when that happens, Chicago will find out about it, and then they will start trying to buy corn acres back. So the price of corn should go up. Um, now, what would change that? Maybe the nitrogen producers decide that they'll lower their prices and corn will be a more economical crop to plant. But you, you got a two-pronged sword here hurting the, the producer. Higher input costs on fertilizer and higher input costs on chemicals. And I'm sure at some point in our discussion this morning we'll go into why the chemicals have gone up so much. I think fertilizer, it's... it's uh, um, not very many producers that are producing, not very many mines that are producing, too few hands uh, competing. And when you don't have enough competition and something like this happens where we get a nice price spike in the commodity, the few players in the fertilizer world are taking advantage. Let's go back to chemicals. Okay, um, the, tell us how the, the flow of from the tech material to the manufacturing to the, to the farmer, how, how, how's that supply chain? And I know they have the West Coast ports and, and we've got COVID and we got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Just kind of walk us through it. Let's start at the, at the beginning. Um, everything that we spray on a field comes out of a well or a mine. It's not some kind of pixie dust that a magic wand gets waved in and it becomes a chemical. So the two highest price products or the highest percent increase products are glyphosate, people know it as Roundup, and glufosinate, 
which people know it as Interline or Liberty. Those two products come out of the ground in a mine process that mines yellow phosphorus. Uh, yellow phosphorus is, is the base raw ingredient that you start with and then you make chemical reactions. And it takes a while, but after it's been processed and enough reactions, you wind up with the chemical and the jug that we spray. China is where most of the yellow phosphorus mines are for, uh, for glyphosate and glufosinate. Mon or Bear now has a, has a mine out in Idaho is about the only one in the United States. But China is having their Winter Olympics this year and they don't want to look bad to the rest of the world. So they've shut down their coal-fired power plants that supply the power to these mines in the Yunnan province. So you got a shortage of the raw ingredient. So production is switching to other places like India, um, other Asian places. But you don't just start a mine because there's a shortage that day. <clears throat> Significant capital expense to do it. So these companies that want to do this, they're a little bit leery because all China would have to do to get all the yellow phosphorus that the world needs would be to turn the switch back on. So they're a little bit reluctant to make a large capital investment to start a new mine. So we got that product shortage. Once they do get it mined out and get the active ingredient built to come to the United States for formulation, um, you know, they'll ship the technical glyphosate over here at 90% and the technical glufosinate over here at 92%, and then it'll get formulated into the products that, that we spray. The ports are jammed up. There's ships, uh, I think somebody said last week there were 77 ships waiting to get unloaded at, at, at uh, Long Beach, California and over 100 at New Orleans. So you got these supply chain. What's that compared to normal? To put uh, it into perspective? Normal would be two or three. And now there's 180 in the United States waiting to get unloaded at just two ports. So you got things going on like ships are leaving New Orleans and going to Mobile Bay to get unloaded and then get trucked back over to Houston where they're going to be formulated or Mississippi. And it's just th there are six or seven loads of freight waiting on every truck in the United States right now. So the, the supply chain is being stretched. People are going to have to pay higher prices to get in front of the line to get your stuff. You talk about getting in the front of the line. Ocean freight used to be two to four thousand dollars per container. Right now, Walmart, Amazon, the box stores, they've got their Black Friday specials coming up for Halloween or for Thanksgiving. Halloween will be the next big holiday. <laughs> <laughs> but but they can't have a Black Friday special with a with an empty store. You know, you're not gonna have a doorbuster so that say, here's a coupon for something that we hope we'll have for you sometime after St. Patrick's Day. You know, so so they're buying up all the ocean freight, and it's bid up to now twenty thousand dollars per container. Well, if you've got formulated products, you can get four thousand gallons in a container. That's five dollars a gallon for the freight that used to cost you fifty cents. So it's just it's out of control on freight, and and there's going to be product delays. I'm confident that the industry will be able to provide a solution for every grower, but it's gonna be a more expensive solution and maybe not your, your first best solution. So say you're on an enlist program. There will be enlist takers this year that, that don't have Roundup or Liberty put on them. They'll put enlist on their E3 soybean with 10 or 12 ounces of clethodim old select to kill the grasses. So you, you'll, you'll have an old school non-GMO solution for your grass control and a high tech value added trait that you can kill your broadleaves. So we'll, we'll see that this year. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll get the weeds killed, we'll get the bugs killed, we'll control the fungus, but we might not be using our first favorite choice and it's definitely gonna cost more money to protect your crop from pests in 2022 than ever in history. Is there any chemical that's going to be in 
adequate supply. I mean, there's no supply chain issues. I mean, made in the U.S. got plenty of supply. Is there any is it any fungicide, insecticide, herbicide that you can think of, or is everything uh, dependent upon either China or India or Southeast Asia? I will give you an answer with a question. How much corn is going to get planted and how many soybeans are going to get planted? Uh, there are adequate supplies of, of a lot of products. Acetochlor is one that there's adequate supply for now. But acetochlor you can put on soybeans too. So is the shortage of metallochlor going to be, you know, are guys going to be putting acetochlor on soybeans where they used to use metallochlor? Um, so basically using surpass instead of dual. Um, once again, I, I think we're I think we're going to get to a solution, but it may not be our favorite first solution when we get there. Yeah, but th th there's no product that's that's oversupplied right now, and all products are up in price. You know, you've got 50% increases in atrazine, 30% um, increases in your acid analids, which would include um, acetochlor and metallochlor. Uh, more than double on glyphosate and glufosinate. I mean, those are more than double. And it's, it's just a situation that it's not just the United States, it, it's the whole world. The whole world is short on those two products especially. So you and I had a conversation prior to the filming of this about why the whole world is using more Liberty. You want to uh, divulge on that just a little bit? Okay. Um, glufosinate is a non-selective herbicide. Basically, if you don't have a trait in it, it'll kill pretty much everything that you get. Uh, everybody knows about Paraquat, also a non-selective herbicide. There's no trait right now that <clears throat> that you can use Paraquat on a on a crop that you want to grow for for grain or oil, but we do with glufosinate. There are some Asian countries that have banned Paraquat and they're still growing food in those areas so they need something to replace the Paraquat and what the first best choice is is glufosinate. So you got this huge increased demand for glufosinate around the world both in traded crops like in list E3 soybeans and in non-selective herbicide uses. I mean, in Asian countries where the grass grows every day because it's tropical climate, they need a tool like Paraquat was, and now they're replacing it with glufosinate. It's like playing Jenga. Take it's like playing out, Jenga. Put and one on top, take a block out, put one on yeah. top. And I'll give credit to our channel suppliers, you know, UPL makes Interline, and they're the world's largest um, capacity producer of that product, and they're doing everything they can. They're increasing their mining capacity. They're increasing their production capacity, but they just can't keep up with demand. And, and until they get to an equilibrium, it's kind of like an intercompany auction. The guy in charge in North America tells UPL's bosses that are divvying up tech, um, our plant in South Carolina that, that we need tech, we will we will take this many pounds of tech at this price. The guy that's in charge of Brazil will say, well, we want it worse than America's, so we will give you extra money for this many pounds. And the guy that's in charge of Vietnam and Indonesia and Asia will say, well, we will give you this much more. So they're having an auction. So in order for UPL to be able to supply the boss of North America, he's going to have to outbid the guy in Brazil. And the guy in Brazil isn't going to bid as high when it's winter down there and he really doesn't need it as we will up here in the northern hemisphere. So it's, it's a unique dynamic. Um, we will achieve equilibrium at some point in time, but it's not going to be in 2022. And the other thing that we have been accustomed to in in crop protection in North America is we've had a 20, 30% safety stock. So at the end of the year, everything has been sprayed. The weeds, bugs, and fungus are, are all under control. And we got 20%, 30% left over in warehouses, safety stock. 
we have no safety stock. So we need to get not just 100% of what we need to get to price equilibrium. We need 120 or 130 percent, and um, expect high crop protection chemical prices through 2023. Yeah, and then with the accelerated demand, you know, farmers understanding this, they're asking for a product, and when you got a lot of people asking for a product and it's short, it makes price go up, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so the question is, is if you are advising a farmer, you know, about herbicides, do you buy it early? Do you, do you wait? What's the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to maintain a good relationship with your ag chemical retailer. So where you've been buying your stuff, you need to make sure that you have a conversation with your supplier. And that's what we do. We have conversations with our customers and, and we tell them, this is what we're going to have available. We will take care of you. And we will. We've, we've got channel partners like UPL that are going to take care of us so that we can take care of, of our core group of customers. Um, the people that are going to be in trouble throughout shortages like this are the ones that send out a bid sheet and, and have whoever's got the lowest price gets, gets the bid. There just won't be enough product for a buyer like that to get a good deal this year. They're just, relationships are gonna be more important in 2022 and 2023 than they ever have. Um, and if you're just a transactional buyer where you send out a bid sheet and try to get the best price. Um, changing suppliers every changing year. Changing suppliers every year. Those suppliers are gonna take care of their core group of customers because they don't have that 20, 30% extra in their warehouse to try and pick up some incremental business off of a bid, bid sheet. They're gonna be doing the best they can to take care of the customer that they take care of every year, year in and year out. So if you, you've been buying from somebody for 10, 20, 30 years? They'll take care of you. Don't, don't worry about it too much. Don't worry you're, about you're it. You're just gonna pay a little more, but you're gonna get product as opposed to not have product. And these retailers, Quality Ag included, we have to compete with all the other retailers. So farmers aren't gonna get jabbed by the retailer. They're gonna get jabbed by the global economic situation, um, which would include um, some um, anti-competitive pricing practices by the mining companies and the chemical companies, which there's a pile of chemical companies, they gotta compete against each other the same as the retailers do. So it's gonna be competitive all the way through to the farm gate. It's just, they're gonna be competing at a price that's here instead of here. Everybody's, everybody's floating on the same ocean. Well, Joe, that, that has to help our listeners on podcasts and also our watchers on Cup of Joe to understand the situation because we're, we're hearing so much. And of course, you read it in the, in the blogs and you hear the conversations going out there. And it's good to hear it from somebody that's on, on the front line fighting a battle every day. Well, I, I just want all of the all the viewers on the podcast or if you're listening on your on your phone know what your expenses are going to be before you pull into the field with the planner and it might be a situation where you call up um, your seed dealer and say i'm going to bring you back 400 acres of seed corn and pick up 400 units of mersman enlist e3 soybeans this year i'm not going to i'm not going to have corn on corn this year and, and I think those will be the first acres that switch, or the corn on corn acres. I think they'll s just naturally switch to soybeans. Um, and then I think there will be some acre competition with commodity prices where corn's gonna have to bid up to get the soybean acre. Um, but it's gonna have to bid up hard because there's, it's just so much more expensive to plant a corn crop than a soybean crop. And right now you can't pencil a, a corn crop corn on corn you got extra insecticide expense extra seed expense you got the extra nitrogen and phosphorus expense it's just a it's an expensive crop to grow in 2022 and i i think growers need to know what their costs are and then decide what they're going to plant corn or soybeans or wheat or milo or hay yeah, and we've been talking about the wheat option particularly on the marginal ground i mean um 
instead of, you know, you're not going to fight the chemical herbicide uh, problem as much. Uh, you know, some areas that use certain broadleafs on for wheat, but for the most part, you know, in the northern areas, they don't use any herbicides, and it's just basically uh, inputs of your fertilizer. So we are seeing, you know, maybe an uptick a little bit on wheat acres uh, in the marginal areas, and and we still have a good supply, so. Uh, That's what I was gonna ask you, how is the wheat supply? We're, we are sold out of our Matty, but we have a real good supply of Katie, and Katie's that ultra early, that which really ties in well for a guy that says, okay, I'm gonna shoot that double crop in. I mean, wheat does make sense for certain farmers. You know, we tell a farmer, if you really wanna get serious about the wheat business, you need to have a drying bin. In other words, take that wheat off at 18% moisture, throw it in the drying bin, fill it up about half full, good air and bring that moisture down and then you'll pick up enough days that you can go ahead and plant that double crop and you'll be planting it in June uh, and, and um, when we're still getting some rain yet and you got a real good shot. I know the farmers that did that this year are looking at a pretty nice uh, uh, yield this year potentially on their double crop soybeans. So, it takes a little bit more work, a little bit more management uh, if you want to do that double crop thing. but. It can work, and then of course, you know we've got the we've got the varieties now that have scab really good scab tolerance. We've got the varieties that stand; they're shorter. You know, they have less straw to fight, and so, and we're getting the ultra earlies like Katie that that make it possible. So, um, like you said, I think that you gave great advice. T tell the farmers do your costing, see what makes sense, and uh, and then apply uh, whatever works on your farm, and then talk to your relationship herbicide buyer that you've been buying from and, and get a plan together and we'll get through it. And then, like they say, the cure for high prices is high prices. And and it'll get fixed. Uh, I'm afraid it won't get fixed in 2022, um, but maybe there's light at, at the end of the tunnel in 23. Um, but probably what will precede fertilizer and chemical prices coming down is our commodity prices coming down. So we need to pedal real hard and, and uh, make uh, make money while we can that's right and this year there's an opportunity to make some money so and hopefully that'll propel us into next year well ben this this week uh we uh attended an ms tech field day on, on enlist soybeans and what what 2300 varieties of, <clears throat> that you were kind of uh, looking at to pick the the top products as product manager here at mershman seeds and uh but you know well, anytime you go to a field day and you get that opportunity to talk to other seedsmen, you always pick up information. We picked up a few nuggets that we'd like to pass along, and and I want to first before we go into the soybean thing, I want to make sure we cover the the corn part, uh, talking about tar spot and southern rust uh, and fungicides and that whole thing. And and now when you harvest your corn this year, test weight, right? Tell us tell us about test weight and disease. And what you can tell just from just from looking at your test weight, without even looking at your corn. Yep. So when you're pulling in the grain elevator and you're looking at your test weights, where you're you may be used to 60 and you're seeing 56, or you, uh, maybe a variety doesn't carry super heavy test weight, and you're looking at that 55, 54 mark, um, it's pretty easy to tell that the the, the corn that that you're harvesting had prematurely died. Uh, when you look at the the kernel in the in the hopper bottom, we're not seeing super long depth uh, kernel. So you may be looking at a division factor of ninety thousand instead of that sixty five thousand when we're doing our corn yield estimates because kernel depth is a lot shallower. It seems that tar spot. Talking to some of the other agronomists and seedsmen, like what you were talking about, tar spot by itself isn't a huge detriment, but when we see tar spot in combination with other leaf diseases that we get out in the field, uh, it, it really accelerates the, the yield penalty, the penalty that we see. Two years ago, it was gray leaf spot and tar spot. When we got those into combination, we were really seeing a 10, 15, 20 bushel yield drag. This year, from the Mississippi River East, from kind of what I'm hearing from our sales managers and other agronomists, is that it is tar spot and southern rust. So when we have the tar spot and the southern rust put together, I mean, I was watching a, another podcast this morning. They were talking about uh, 60, even 100 bushel yield losses associated with that. And when you put all of that together, 
most of the time it's a premature death and you're seeing lighter test weight because the kernel didn't have the opportunity to fill all the way through like uh, a corn plant wants to and that's why fungicides are, are so key um, because you want to protect that plant as long as possible. Uh, we had some anecdotal evidence from one of our sales managers in western Illinois was talking about any place where the plane doubled up on the end rows or there's a little bit of overlap from from pass to pass there's you know five six percent higher moisture and a heck of a lot higher yield so this is going to be one of those things where tar spot isn't present when you're pulling the trigger uh, at tassel time so this is one of those things where we might have to be thinking about an additional input which is harder on you know, making the money that you need to on corn, but we may, need, we may need to be thinking about an additional fungicide and which combination of a more expensive fungicide versus a less expensive fungicide do we need to protect the crop to get it all the way to the end because this year, even the guys that put fungicide on are, are having detriment to their... To their so to the, their the, the fungicide ran out the, and then the disease came in late, so are we going to have to delay or double up our fungicides two applications two applications looks like on the on your best acre highest yield potential corn might be something to try yep and there's a little bit of a shameless plug you know if you have stein 9714 or stein 9709 and that crop is only six and a half seven foot tall um, planted at higher pops and doing everything in the stein program you know you might be able to save 10 bucks an acre by being able to go over it with your own ground rig rather than having to hire the helicopter or the spray plane to come in one more time. So. And, and have more control on the timing rather than, you know, when the spray plane can get to you. Right. Yeah, if you go out in the plot and you see the, the shorter style hybrids, uh, they would definitely lend to additional applications of fungicide with a ground rig, no question about it. And those, and those products fit very nicely into the high management, high yield, uh, you know, that shorter stature stuff, that's where it fits. It's not on the, the, the more variable acre. Well, let's, let's switch now back to soybeans and, and talk a little bit about the, some of the little nuggets that we picked up um, at the uh, MS Tech in, in List Field Day. About, you know, one of the things that we run into is, you know, obviously dicamba injury. And what we're noticing uh, about includers and excluders for salt and you might explain what that is and then how potentially we think might relate to dicamba injury yeah so uh, an excluder versus an includer on soybeans most of the charts that you look at when you're open up a seed guide will talk about in includers versus excluders and that's for the saline acre that has high salt content a lot of irrigated ground has ends up being higher salt so they, they want they want uh, excluders Correct. So basically that plant has the ability to take water up and keep the salt out of the water without having a detriment to uh, most plants when they, they take the salt in, it's actually a detriment. They're not getting the water that they need. So it's like drinking salt water. Yeah. You know, you end up more thirsty at the it end of the day. Moves up the plant, stunts the plant. Yep. The, ex uh, the, excluder, or the excluders keep it in the roots yep. and let it move up. Yep. So talking to some of the breeding guys, up at this field day, you know, it's just anecdotal and you're hearing about certain varieties are handling and recovering from these dicamba symptoms faster. You know, it may only take one node versus three or four nodes that are affected. Um, it's anecdotal and it's, it's, it's a theory at best, but some of these excluders are recovering faster than um, products that don't have that excluder gene in them. But Atlanta, for example, yep. is an excluder in our lineup and, and all of our customers and our salespeople in the field are saying this thing gets hit, boom, pops right back out of it, excluder. So there, there are some products even as early as group two that have, have this same excluder thing. So is that something that we need to watch for? And then and number two is just in the normal breeding process over the last few years, we get hit, our plots get hit, and we're seeing the newer, the newest products seem to recover faster from dicamba injury than the first generation products per se. Yep. So this is something we're watching, so uh, we're passing it on so you can watch too. Now, the other little tidbit we, we talked about is 
the Extend Flex architecture of the soybean. As we're talking to other seedsmen, they're saying the Enlist beans are bushier. In other words, they have lateral branches, and lateral branches have pods. The appearance of a lot of the Extend Flex products are single stem, no, no branching. So we're just saying, hey, if, uh, if you've got both technologies on your farms or different farms, uh, look at the architecture of the plant. Um, a single stem is not necessarily bad, but many times can limit some yield potential if you don't get your population right and everything like that. So we think the Enlist soybeans, architecture-wise, um, you know, they have they have lean-tos on the house, you know, which uh, you might say are the barn, and so that lends to potentially uh, more yield. So uh, we'll see how that turns out, but we're just pointing that fact out and what, want folks to, to think about it. The other thing that I have, and then Ben, I'll let you wrap up with, with anything else that you have, is uh, um, we believe that EPA is meeting next week with uh, Bayer Monsanto to talk about this off-target movement, and it's going to be a serious conversation. So we'll see what comes out of that. Obviously, nothing's going to come out the same day, but within the weeks following, something will come out. So we, we have a hy hypothetical here, okay? Now that's hypothetical, and, and, and again, our job is to, is to try to talk about what could happen, may not happen, but just to get you thinking, and you know, and then you can, you can even say, Joe, you're 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 delusional. You're you know, you're you're out of it. So, but it is theoretically possible that uh, the EPA will say, you know what, this dicamba off-target movement, not only on soybeans, but the trees and ornamentals and everything, is out of control. We're going to either have an extremely early cutoff date for dicamba, or we're going to ban dicamba completely for post-application and it will be a pre-emerge product only. And that would be a big blow to farmers uh, that, that like the dicamba system. Knowing how, not all farmers, but a few, there's a few renegades out there say, you know, my back 40 is my back 40, I'll do what I want, nobody's gonna tell me what to do. They may go ahead and sp spray whenever they want and uh, the off-target movement won't be any different, um, even when they, Change the label and said it's only going to be a pre-emerge or a very, very early cutoff. And then in 2023, the EPA says, you know, uh, we had all this movement. You know, there's only one thing we can do. We're going to ban the sale of dicamba soybeans, period. Because if the farmers won't follow the label, applicators won't follow the label, we just won't make it available. So in 2023 we could lose the technology completely. Now that, that's probably the most bizarre thing you're gonna hear from me <laughs> in quite a while, but it is theoretically possible that that could happen, that scenario could happen. You know, there's a lot of people say never say never. So the responsibility of farmers and whatever the label is, that's the key. If we wanna keep these technologies, we have to follow labels and be responsible because if we don't, we're gonna have somebody controlling what we do in our back 40. So that's my, my two cents. Ben, do you have anything else as far as the agronomic side? I know, I know we could talk about yield already, uh, but and one of the things that I've suggested this year, rather than talk about the 300 bushel corn or the 85 bushel soybeans, let's talk about varieties. Because not everybody gets 300 bushel corn. Not everybody gets 85 bushel soybeans. And I don't know about you, uh, I, I would bet the farmer that's raising 50 bushel soybeans and 180 bushel corn work just as hard as the guy that was doing the 300. And some of it's the thousand variables we don't control. So we think it's more important to talk about varieties because really we want to get you in the right space so you have the highest yield potential. Correct. Because otherwise it sounds like a broken record. I mean, if you tune into any podcast or, or watch any anything from other seed companies, they're all talking about their 300 bushel or 80 bushel soybeans. And it gets a little bit, I don't know about you, but I would be, it gets a little bit old. It, 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 it's like when I talk to farmers, they say, you never want to be the first person to say your yield. <laughs> you always want to be the last person. First liar never had a chance. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, uh, do you have anything else? I just wanted to thank Joe. Sinclair from Quality Ag Service. 
out of Albia, Melrose, and what's the third location? We've got a uh, store and agency, and we're building one up in uh, Buchanan County right now. Gotcha. I just wanted to thank Joe for coming on and passing along all the awesome information. If somebody wanted to contact you, how do, how do you contact Quality Ag Service Incorporated? We're on the World Wide Web at qualityag.com, and there's a toll-free number there. Um, I have actually three things I would like to close with. Um, first, thanks to my teammate here. Ben and my teammate Joe and, and the teammate that you can't see behind the cameras. But we do have a team approach and our team includes our vendors and our customers. So we want to thank all them. This will probably be the last pod, second thing, and this will probably be the last podcast that a lot of our viewers will, will see before they go to the field. And our most important job is to get home safe the day that we, uh, every day. So uh, be safe. Harvest seems like uh, there's a lot of running around and people get in a hurry, and that's when uh, mistakes that cost safety happen. So please be safe. And uh, last thing I would say, if you're not quite ready to go to the field, walk out into your corn, guys, 100 rows, and push on the stalks and see which fields you need to pick first by which stalks are going over the quickest. Uh, we're, we're seeing some crown rots. Um, there's anthracnose growing. Um, we've got, we've got, stock rots that are going to be a factor late season. They're not a factor right now, but if you go out in, in to your cornfields and just walk out there 100 rows, push a, push a stock over and see how, see how your corn's standing, and maybe you don't go to the driest field first. You go to the one that's got the, the weakest stock. Good, good, good point. Very good point. And of course, you can do the pinch test too, you know, up, yep. up above the ground, see how the stock's deteriorating. Um, so our farmers know all that, but that's really good advice. Well, that brings us, uh, well, I got one more thing. Uh, today we film on Friday, and today we're having a pizza party at noon, if you stick around, Joe. I mean, uh, and why do we have a pizza party? And that's because anytime we get 100% purity or 100% germ, that's like a state championship to us. And we just, yeah, yesterday, Iowa State University uh, sent in a uh, uh, a report on our Maddie 3 and uh, we had 100% purity. Uh, the germ was 94, which is, that's a really nice germ, uh, but 100% purity. I've never, ever seen 100% purity on our wheat. And and, I, and I'm telling the guys in the plant, I says, you're with our color sorters now, it's getting too easy for you guys to win, you know, but we're still going to celebrate. So quality is important to Mersman Seeds and we work very hard at it and uh, the improvements that we made in our plant the last two years have, are really starting to show up on the quality side. So let's go to the corny jokes. Now these some of you may have heard these but they're still pretty good. Okay and, and these I got two cow jokes and I got a sport a sports joke because I thought the sport one we need to throw in. Um, and these came from Dave O'Hara and his friend Colette uh, Dave O'Hare uh, Sports uh, does a, uh, um, a weekly show statewide uh, on called Hawkeye, and of course I'm a Hawkeye fan. So, uh, and I I love my Iowa State Cyclone folks and University of Illinois and Missouri folks. They're all good folks, but you know I, I tend to lean towards the Hawkeyes. But uh, anyhow, if you don't, if you're a Hawkeye fan, be sure to check out Dave O'Hare Sports. He's uh, he's on the uh, the Cedar Rapids, Ottumwa, uh, Sioux City, and Des Moines stations now. So anyhow, he likes to, to pass on corny jokes to me. So what do you call a cow with no legs? What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef, okay? What do you call a cow with three legs? What do you call a cow with three legs? Lean beef, okay? <laughs> now, this one here you might enjoy a little bit. What is the quietest sport? The quietest sport. Now we're not talking about chess or not talking necessarily about golf. Think about what would be the quietest sport? Bowling. And Ben, you're supposed to say, why bowling? Why bowling, Joe? Because you can hear a pin drop. <laughs> now that one's not too bad. Thanks, Dave and Colette for uh, uh, the jokes and I hope like again all of us here wish you a, a safe harvest and a profitable harvest and looking forward to getting ready for next year and do it all over again. See you next week. Thanks for listening to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. 
Don't forget, you can also listen to us on your favorite podcast platform. 